I'm Nancy, and my co-host is Becky, and we are going to be talking about Laura Donaldson's Slow Thinking is Life-Saving for Dogs course. So Becky is sort of the MC for this. Turning it over to her. Okay, I have to unpin you. Yeah, I think you have to take the pinning and unpinning if I'm gonna put videos up. That's fine. Tell so, me, tell, well, you have to do Marty first. Who's after Marty? Um, you. Okay, I can do that. Okay then. Hi, everybody. Hello, Lynn. Hello. Just wanna make sure you can hear me and that I haven't undone something. Okay, so um, we're gonna start this evening with an opening and Marty wasn't able to be on tonight, so she pre-recorded her overview of slow thinking. Are you seeing Marty? We are. Great. We had the wonderful opportunity to take part in a four week course called Slow Thinking is Life Saving for Dogs, put on by Laura Donaldson, a behavioral consultant and trainer local to the Ithaca area. Laura uses a cognitive behavioral pr approach supported by research to help dogs struggling with aggression and other issues. Her newest work on slow thinking is based on the premise that how dogs perceive a situation determines decision they, decisions they make about their behavior and that changing dogs thinking will help change their behavior. Slow thinking uses interactive games and other techniques that teach self-interruption, cognitive reappraisal, and social problem solving to help dogs change their responses to scary stimuli in their environment. And with these new skills, dogs can become more independent problem solvers who, when faced with situations they find scary, are better able to stay calm and focused. To help explain what happens with dogs that are aggressive, Laura discussed some of the research into the neurobehavioral underpinnings of cognition in both dogs and humans, and introduced the concept of fast twitch thinking. Fast twitch thinking is the muscle memory that goes along with cognition that allows us to respond quickly to stimuli. Both dogs and people use fast twitch thinking, which can be very useful and needed. For example, people use fast twitch thinking while driving when swerving from an oncoming car in our lane or when playing music. You respond quickly to stimuli in the environment without taking the time to think through and process each step. But fast twitch thinking in humans can also lead to stereotypes and bias based on faulty or incomplete data. The same thing happens in dogs. Aggressive or traumatized dogs use fast twitch thinking to react before reading the situation, with dogs habitually misinterpreting information from the environment by overestimating the harmful intent. This causes mistakes in perception, which then leads to bad decision making and aggressive and other behavioral problems. Traditionally, canine aggression is dealt with in one of two approaches or a combination of both. In the first approach, aggression is seen as a bad behavior that either needs to be corrected or a replacement behavior needs to be developed. The second approach looks at aggression as an emotional issue as some form of, and then some form of desensitization exercises are utilized. Laura's prior experience and lack of success with these methods with aggressive dogs led her to, to her work with slow thinking. Slow thinking addresses both the cognitive and emotional needs of dogs to help dogs develop more adaptive and successful behaviors to use in social settings with people and other dogs. So how does so slow thinking address this? Simply put, aggressive dogs misread social cues in their environment and they are reacting to fear, anxiety, and stress. I will briefly explain two of the key components in slow thinking, cognitive reappraisal, and social problem solving. 
Cognitive reappraisal decreases arousal in response to negative stimuli, slowing down the dog's thinking and enabling dogs to reframe, rethink, and revalue data they are taking in. With decreased arousal, dogs are better able to read their environment and do a better risk assessment as to whether a particular stimuli represents danger. The next component is social problem solving. Social problem solving helps dogs stop using aggressive behaviors as an automatic response and learn to think before they react. With decreased arousal, dogs can learn through their own responses what are more effective behaviors. Slow thinking involves a variety of exercises that will be discussed today to help to empower dogs to discover and use new and more adaptive behaviors that will affect their environment so they can obtain their desired goal. It's important to remember that dogs are not ethical creatures. They do what works. Aggression or other behaviors is just their best attempt to achieve what they need. Dogs that are aggressive or reacting to trauma lack social problem skills that help them develop better and more adaptive options. Slow thinking brings together a variety of strategies to address behavioral issues, and as the title suggests, can be life-saving in working with aggressive dogs. But slow thinking also has applicability with all dogs in that it provides us with both a philosophy and tools to address the cognitive, social, and emotional needs of our dogs. It can be very effective working with the shy puppy, the fearful rescue, the dog that has just been through a traumatizing experience, and the dog that is involved with training and competitions. Slow thinking helps dogs slow down their interactions, enables dogs to process and learn. Too often, we can rush dogs through learning opportunities and overwhelm them. As Laura mentioned, our tendency is to over cue and micromanage our dogs. We do not always give our dogs the time and opportunity to act upon their environment, get feedback and adjust their behaviors. This training reinforced many concepts we already know, but bear repeating and reinforcing. With all dogs, not just aggressive or fearful dogs, we need to put more emphasis on learning from our dogs and paying attention to who they are, what is important to them, why they are expressing themselves in certain ways, and focus on how to help dogs feel safe, empowered, and confident. Knowing when to step in and when to give them space and remembering it is a mutual learning experience. We had the wonderful opportunity to Sorry. take part in a four week course <laughs> called Slow Thinking is Life Saving for Dogs, put oh. on by Laura Donaldson. There you go. You know, a little bit, little bit of practice. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, to my, welcome to my world. Yeah, for sure. So I guess I'm up next and I am going to do a share screen because I'm going to be talking about what is known as free work. Hello. There we go. One of the one of the major takeaways that I got from this is that our dogs, the dogs that belong to people who are club members live really good lives because they are involved in various dog sports and their lives are enriched and their their people are engaged in their lives and boy our dogs must be in the top five at least five percent of dog lives because of the fact that we do stuff with our dogs when i was watching some of the free work videos that were posted on the Facebook page this, that was part of this group, I was kind of shocked to see that people were amazed at how their dogs were reacting and that their dogs were actually interacting and curious about doing free work. And that was kind of driven home to me yesterday because I was coming back from a long walk with my pups, slow because Keo is a little lame at this point. And the neighbor had their dog out and 
I just heard her saying from a far distance, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, because she wanted the dog to go to the bathroom so the dog could get shoved back in the house so they could go to work. And they actually call, they tell the dog, the cue for the dog to go to the bathroom is hurry up. When you talk about free work, it's kind of like a combination of a treasure hunt and an obstacle course. It was developed in the UK by a trainer whose name is Sarah Fisher. And the main focus of this is to basically observe your dog and watch how your dog works through these various courses that you put together. They, it can be hugely beneficial to all dogs, but from my perspective, it's going to be truly beneficial to puppies who are still learning about, you know, um, proprioception where their bodies are in space and learning how to be bold in various environments as well as rescue dogs. So this, these are, I, I just went on the internet and I took a couple of screenshots of various free work setups that were there. So you need a little bit of space. You need a variety of obj objects and obstacles and they should be of varying heights and of varying textures and they should look different. You need to have things that dogs can put their nose in. You need to have things that dogs can walk on or climb on as long as it's safe. The emphasis is always on safety. You need a couple of water bowls at various heights so you can see whether or not your dog drinks out of a, the bowl that's low or the bowl that's high and how they, how they actually use their tongue to drink. And basically the whole idea when you're setting these courses up is that the dog should have a choice in what it interacts with. The next thing that you're going to need is a bunch of different types of cookies. You want something soft that you can smear on some of these articles or obstacles. You want hard treats that the dog can pick up and chew. And then after you put some food out and you have around these obstacles, you watch to see what does your dog like to do? Will it walk on a blanket? Will it walk on a grate? Will it walk on a tarp? Will it climb into a pool filled with stuff like this dog is in the lower left-hand corner? The dog should run naked, which means that the dog needs to be in some sort of a confined space. So if something happens, it's not gonna take off and go missing. So you have these uneven surfaces, you have weird things for the dog to look at and climb on. And the purpose is that you observe your dog and see how they interact and see what might give them a little bit more trouble than other things. And see if you can sort of manipulate things to get your dog to be a little bit more confident. And you, Again, the dog runs free and the dog has a choice and you give the dog enough time to scope everything out. There was one woman who posted a 22 minute video of her dog engaged in free work, which to me, I mean, good for that dog now that the, the person is actually doing something to help get the dog engaged in life. But I feel bad for the dog in its previous life where it was living probably what was a boring life. So, the whole purpose of free work is to allow your dog choice and for you to observe your dog so you learn more about how your dog is interacting with the world. This is just another, a couple of other courses, pictures that I took. And one of the main, I view everything, I view all dog sports, not all dog sports, but most dog sports from the filter or through the filter of nose work. And I think about, I. I pulled out three videos of my pups doing various nose work searches and I took some pictures. Here's Toka in a search down in Virginia, all sorts of different things in the area, all sorts of different things in the area, people in the area, all sorts of different things in the area and, and various footings. He has to go upstairs and walk on cement and he walks on gravel and he has to walk on wood. So nose work to me, is a lot like free work, except instead of looking for food directly, the dog's looking for odor and then getting rewarded. And of course, I'm a little biased towards the sport of nose work, if you haven't noticed. 
nose work gives dogs a lot of confidence because of all of the things that they are exposed to. I just wanna hop back to this because these are some of the benefits that go hand in hand with free work. Really it helps, in, helps create independent thinking in your dog. Definitely important for building confidence because your dog is allowed to explore and check things out at his or her own pace. It's great for all dogs, even dogs that are older because they're not jumping on and off things, right? It's low impact. And 40% of a dog's brain is used for the sense of olfaction. So sure enough, it's going to utilize their natural foraging and hunting behaviors. And it's, it's a great way to just let your dog unwind and relax. And they don't have any expectations, right? You're not trying to force them to find something or, or, or look at something. They just walk from thing to thing and find food if they, and eat it if they like it. And if they don't like it, they bypass it. So this is a biggie for me, creates positive associations with new environments. And a couple of our newer members in particular do fabulous jobs with fostering dogs. Lisa is one of them. And I know she does a lot of free work type exercises with her dogs because a lot of them have come from pretty bad situations. The key here is that the session needs to be set up correctly because you can't have something that is tippy or scary right off the bat. You have to have the dog being able to walk on something solid and you slowly add things that are a little bit more um, concerning to the dog. You don't put them in a scary situation right off the bat. Another issue that I think is important is that you can use this to identify physical problems because you're wa watching your dog run naked. They don't have a collar on, they don't have a harness on, they're just moving normally. And if they're moving in, in a certain fashion when they are, stating another person or two, excuse me. If they're moving in a certain fashion when they're not on a harness or a lead and something happens as soon as you put a harness on, they might have some sort of physical problem that needs to be addressed. So I think it's a great, I think this is a great exercise. These are great exercises for puppies. Certainly great for dogs that are rescues or have had bad, bad experiences that need to build up confidence again. It's all about having fun and, and giving your dog an enriched life. Any questions before I, we go to the next person? Yes, I have a question about free work, Nancy. Yeah. Um, so the person that developed it, how, how often does she recommend doing it? How many times a day? How many days a week? Does it benefit all dogs? Does she have documented evidence to show that it benefits all dogs? I don't have any of that information, Sue, but I'll check it out and I'll let you know what I find out. Okay, I can also Google it because I've heard of free work before. I just, I mean, I think it's great. Uh, a lot of us have dogs that get plenty of free work without having to set it up. Right, my um, house, for example. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or all the stuff that my dogs do. But for dogs that don't get to do all the stuff that our dogs get to do, I think it's a great idea. I'm just curious how often she recommends it. So I can Google it also. I just was wondering if you knew, but okay, thanks. How big an area, Nancy, do you need to do this in? You know, if you take a look at some, if you take a look at some of these spaces, they're not terribly huge, right? This is basically, this is the only thing in the free work area. This is not terribly huge. The, I, the, the biggest thing that, the biggest takeaway for me was that the dog should be in some sort of a contained area so if something happens, they don't get startled and run away or another dog can't come in and pester them. It's just, the dog should have the ability to run naked safely. So you could do it inside, you could do it outside, you can do it in your garage, you can do it in your living room. I'm having some work done in my house so there's stuff piled all over inside my house and my dog's like, hey, I haven't seen this here before, what is it? Inside of my house is now all free work doesn't have to be a huge space. It's really more the variety. And 
that said, let me give a little plug for something that I have already talked about with our esteemed training director, Lynn Anguish. I am going to run what I call Fido's Funky Footing Fiesta at my house later this spring, as soon as the snow is gone. And basically it, it's a, vaguely a form of free work. I put out a whole bunch of different things that dogs can walk on, tarps, grates, ramps, um, uh, anything you can possibly think of that I have in my shed. And you just come on over with your dog and have them walk on it, they have to be leashed. So it's not quite free work, but I think it's a really good opportunity for dogs to experience walking on different footing and building confidence in doing that. So stay tuned for more on that. Anything else, guys? All right, who's next up on the docket, Becky? I believe oh. that's me. Mm -hmm. All right, Lynn. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm primarily going to be summarizing the uh, Dislat game. Um, so again, uh, because so many of the behavioral issues in dogs are caused by fear, stress, or anxiety, uh, the goal is to help them reduce the level of negative emotional arousal they feel when they're presented with triggers. And as uh, Marty was saying, one of the key words that we're talking about here is cognitive reappraisal, which is going to allow the dogs to reframe and rethink the situations they find themselves in. And slow thinking, the slow thinking program in some of these games, what, it, what they're supposed to do is allow your dog, it, it buys some time <laughs> for them to take a moment and think about it. And my kids will tell you that one of the things they used to hate about me when they were doing things is I would always just say, just, just take a little moment. <laughs> Before you do that, just take a little moment. <laughs> um, and this is kind of what you're helping train your dog to do is take a little moment and not do a, just a knee jerk reaction. Take a moment, assess the situation, make a decision about how they're going to uh, approach it. Um, so one of the foundational exercises that Laura Donaldson uses for this is what she, a uh, game she's developed, she calls it the DISLAT game. This stands for disengagement, look at that. Um, I personally would have called it lactis <laughs> because actually what you're asking the dog to do is look at a situation, then self-interrupt and disengage. They don't disengage first and then look. They're actually looking first and then disengaging. So the, um, the look at that part is sort of the first part is you're trying to, is it's building on, if anyone's read or worked with uh, Control Unleashed, it builds on um, Leslie McDevitt's look at that training which is the idea that you allow your dog to look at the trigger, look at the situation, and then you sort of in the beginning help them disengage. You, you say, for instance, with Ruby, I would, she had trouble with approaching dogs because she'd been attacked several times by off-leash dogs when she was a puppy. So when I'd see a dog, you know, for years I tried to look at me, look at me, that absolutely didn't work because she was terrified of the situation. She needed to look and assess what was going on. Um, so I started using the look at that. And so if she were approaching another dog, I could say, look at the dog and, inst and of course she's gonna look at the dog. I didn't have to train her to look at the dog because that's what she was gonna do was look at the dog. But as soon as I caught her, locking her eye on that dog, I would say, good girl, pull her back and give her a treat and then build on that. Um, and over time, this worked way better. Let her look at the dog, make a decision. Is that a safe dog to walk past or an unsafe dog? Um, I, Laura Donaldson added several tweaks to this, which I'm about to describe, and I will tell you why it works even better. Um, in her game, you used a food or a treat to stand in for any all, or all triggers, whether that's another dog, a stranger, 
the front door, a doorbell, the vacuum cleaner, whatever it is, you start using uh, this one piece of food as sort of the distraction. What's nice about this is you don't have to wait till you are coming across another dog or a stranger to do the training. <laughs> it, you can use this as a substitute and work on building this little moment of thinking into what your dog is doing. Um, how the game is set up is that you work at home in a safe or in your garage in a safe space with not any other big distractions. You have your dog on a short leash. You toss out a piece of food. The very first time you do it, you toss out a piece of food, let your dog get to the end and you toss that food out farther than the length of your leash. And so the dog goes after it, but he can't get it. You wait a minute and then you say, go ahead, get it. The second time you do this, you do this, you do not let the dog go get the food. You let them get to the end of the leash. You just wait patiently until the dog kind of decides to turn and look at you and go, what's up? As soon as that you do that, you, the dog does that, you turn away, run four or five feet in the opposite direction away from the food that's on the floor and place down four or five treats on the floor. Um, and you only do this like three times in a session. And as you do this, um, every session varies when they get the treat. Sometimes it's the first time, sometimes it's the second time, sometimes it's the third time. Um, and Becky, can you do that short video of Monk to sort of demonstrate a little bit what this looks like? It doesn't take long for him to decide to find some other way to get this treat. So I'm throwing out the treat and it's beyond where he can get it. <laughs> and he just turns and comes back. I go the other way and lay down food for him. Ideally, it would have been better if there was more space to do this. Um, do you want me to play it again? Ooh. No, no, that's fine. It, it, it sort of just gives this a, a sort of an idea of what it looks like. Um, some of the reasons I feel like this really works well is that you're, you start building in practice this moment where they take a moment go, they're, they're driven forward because they want that treat. They have to make a decision like, is, it, is this gonna work? How, how, how can I get this thing that I want? Oh, oh yeah. And they turn and they learn that coming back to you is going to pay off way better than go, going after the one treat. So part of this is to use high value treats when you're rewarding on this way back. Uh, <clears throat> the other couple of things that make this work is the movement. I don't haul, I'm not hauling the dog back to me after they've looked at the object. I'm letting them, to, because I'm running the other way, that gets them in, into movement and moves them away from the trigger. They're moving freely on their own. Um, they're moving farther away from whatever's bothering them. Um, and as well, putting this idea of treating on the ground. You know, I was always in the habit of treating Ruby when she came back to me from my hands since she's a small dog that would make her jump, that would make her into a, a still high arousal state. Whereas putting the food, four or five pieces of food on the ground works to lower all that arousal state, keeps, keeps it in a kind of a calm moment. Um, so part of it is that while they're eating from the ground, also this is sort of, they're still in charge. They're in charge of making the decision. So the whole way through this game, you're allowing them to be in charge. They're in charge of deciding when to turn and come back to you. They're deciding how, what speed they're gonna come back to you. Um, <clears throat> they're deciding how quickly they wanna eat the food on the ground. Are they gonna focus on that or take a glance at the dog that's coming down the road? Um, this has been very helpful for Ruby. It gives her a chance to look at the dog and say, oh, this is a little dog, I'm not worried. Or this is, this is a big dog, but it's not paying any attention to me at all. I can keep moving. Um, <clears throat> And if it is a dog that is lunging at the end of its leash, I allow her to go ahead and keep an eye on the dog. It would be unfair of me to ask her not to look at a dog that's
that's worrisome. I'm looking at that dog. <laughs> um, also, the other thing I was going to say is this works for as you uh, go to a transition after you've worked a bunch in, on this first step, you can start putting neutral objects into the area and sort of doing towards um, throwing the tree towards a, some kind of neutral object that's in the space as well. It could be a paper towel roll, it could be a Kleenex box, anything. And she works up to a con with frozen goodies in it and has the dog uh, decide to disengage from that. And once they can do that, you're ready to start using the trigger thing. If it's the vacuum, I used it with Ruby with the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> And now she has no trouble going up to a vacuum cleaner when it's off. We have not gotten to going up to the vacuum cleaner when it's on, <laughs> but so it can be used to uh, let a dog make a decision about whether they're going to go to something they think is scary. It can be used. Um, we, uh, Lynn and Anguish and I teach out at George Jr. And we had a really nice success with, I gave this exercise to a person who had an older French, French bulldog that had never, never once <laughs> had any kind of leash obedience training. <laughs> it was just a small tank that was like on automatic pilot forward and had never had any clue that it should do anything else but just drive forward. After this game, <laughs> doing this game and increasing focus like, oh, the good stuff happens if I check in with my hand, my owner handler, the dog did a very short uh, loose leash walk pattern for its uh, CGC. And it was slightly in front of the owner, but it had its little fat neck turned and it looked at its <laughs> owner the whole way through the walk. And it, it was just like a, a wonderful thing to see. So this could be a useful uh, exercise for quite a number of dogs. And that's any questions, I guess. I have a question. Um, I'm confused as to the purpose of this game and what dogs would benefit from it. And um, is it used to treat behavior issues or is it just to teach your dog to pay more attention to you? I'm a little confused. Oh. It's the, my, the major thing it's training the dog to do is to stop and think. You want the dog to stop and think instead of just immediately making a decision. You know, it's like how to, the practice of stopping and thinking during doing this game works into real life that they, they start taking a little minute before they do things. <laughs> right, but I don't understand. I mean, the dog, once they, this is basically a trained behavior. So they're not stopping to think, they're just coming back for the treat. I, I don't quite understand. Um, I guess I don't really understand. Yeah, I, I think when, when you tr try it, there it's not exactly, what, what they have done is, learned on their own how to disengage from something. So it's like my dog now can on her own, instead of me yanking her look away from another dog, she makes a decision to look back at, to break that stare. And that's not exactly the learn, she hasn't learned that uh, not to, let's see how can I kind of put this. Um, it, for me, getting her to decide it was okay not to look at another dog was a big deal because she would go into a hard, stiff stare. <laughs> and this has allowed her to have a free decision I, about when she feels comfortable looking away from that other dog. It's like, okay, I can break that stare now because I've checked out the situation. I know it's safe to look back and, and break that stare. And yeah, I could get good stuff if I do that. I can get a treat if I do that. But part of it was she was so intent. You'll have dogs that are so focused on the other dog 
whether it's to play with them or because they want to be pre you know, sort of defensive. Um, they can't, they can't think, you know, I, I, in the beginning, I couldn't even get a treat in her mouth. She was so focused. And in that already in that hyper aroused zone that there was nothing I could do with her. <laughs> I could say she would not even take a treat because she would be too intent on that situation. So it, it, there is a learned behavior in coming back to you. And that's something that, you know, I start with puppies, you know, if you have a puppy and I just have them on a leash in the house, they pretty soon learned Well, I get to the end of the leash and I turn around, come back, she'll give me something. It's a learned behavior there. But the behavior we're trying to get the dogs to do with this exercise is to learn how to, on their own, decide to break how, how they can on their own decide to break a, a pattern how they can self-distract or decide okay i see that i'm done with that instead of becoming fixated <laughs> and that's where the dogs okay. have problems have problems so the goal is to get this out of the house into the real world for dogs that have anxiety or aggression or yeah. Or fixing so you wouldn't and always do it, you know, it, you would say you could start it well back from the dog park, way on the other side of the parking lot, throwing food in the direction of the park, of the dog park with all the dogs running around and, and practice them going, you know, I don't have to start those, you know, and sometimes you might have to wait four or five minutes before they decide they're not going to stare at those dogs anymore. But part of it is letting them make the decision to disengage. And with practice, it gets easier for them to do. It seems like a strange thing, but it does. <laughs> I have had it. Uh, <laughs> I've taught a version, a version of that to my dogs to teach them to come to me if they see other people or other dogs to check in to make sure it's okay to go say hi or not. But, um, does she talk about what to do? I mean, it seems to me like just letting the dogs there for several minutes is a bit counterproductive. Uh, did she say what to do if it doesn't work or what to do if the dog doesn't disengage or if the arousal gets higher? You, you take it back a step. You go back to doing it with neutral objects or with the Kong, you do it, or you take it back to doing it just in your driveway. You take, if they can't, if they really can't disengage, then you haven't, prepared them with enough disengagement practice before you got there. So like anything else, you take it a step back when it's not working. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in pattern games when I talk about pattern games. Okay, and, um, and I'm assuming that she doesn't say that this one exercise will solve a dog's behavior. Uh, uh, yes, I'm assuming not at there's, all. Okay, so there's lots <laughs> of it's one it's one little portion of the whole thing it's it's a little portion of a little exercise that helps the dog take that little moment it buys you that time for them to take a little moment and part of it is you're allowing them to make the decision on their own i'm not telling like with this now with the dislat that i do with her instead of doing the complete look at that look at the dog then get a reward I don't say anything. I don't say anything. I don't have to say anything. We're just walking like normal. She sees a dog. She starts licking her chops because she knows it could be a treat coming. And she assesses, makes an assessment about, is this a safe dog or not a safe dog? That's a safe dog. I don't have to look at it. I'll come for a treat. <laughs> And I don't really say anything anymore. I don't have to say, do go through this whole, look at that dog, do you see a dog? <laughs> you know, it's a, it, and I'm not yanking her around. It's all stuff she's deciding to do on her own. And I think that's the big thing is I don't want to always be managing that behavior. Okay, thank you. Marguerite, did you want to? Uh, did you have something? something to throw in about Dislat, Marguerite? No, she's up next. Well, well no. one thing that I'll say about Dislat is it's just one of the tools in the toolbox that 
um, Laura Donaldson gave us. And she said, there's no blueprint. You know, there's no steps one through 20 you do with your dog that is aggressive. Um, you know, it just, there are lots of different things that you can do. Um, so that leads into what I'm talking about. And I have two videos. Um, the first one explains what a snafari is, which is another tool. Um, and the second one is an actual snafari. And both videos end kind of abruptly because I was trying to make them fit in the time slot that I had. The second video is an actual snafari and it has my other dog in the background is, is um, making a little noise because he wants to be in on the action. So here goes. The subject I want to talk about today is taking your dog on a snafari. And um, this is based on an article about taking your dog on the safari by Karen P. London, <laughs> PhD, who is a certified professional dog trainer and behaviorist for over 25 years. And um, this is from a download that Laura Donaldson gave us in our slow thinking class. <laughs> so the definition of a safari is a type of walk where you let your dog sniff wherever she wants and you let her go wherever she wants. So it's not the type of walk that you always want to go on. Um, or at least for me, I, I, there are times when I just want to go on a walk for 30 minutes, get some exercise, brisk exercise, and I don't want my dogs to sniff a lot. So what um, Karen C. London um, recommends is that you use a different harness or collar when you're on a safari than when you're on a walk to get a lot of exercise. Um, Um, the author, let's see. So why do a sniffer? Um, well, sniffing is a really basic need of dogs. 40% of their brains are um, devoted to olfaction. And sniffing for them is very calming. It's very relaxing. <laughs> But what I found when I took my dog. Is there sound coming out, Becky? No. no. Class had started. And I just let her sniff for 15 so minutes. So it's just very quiet. It, I was amazed at how relaxed she was when the class started. Because it was a brand new space and she was around brand new dogs she never met before. Can and you I, back it up a little bit, Becky? A little bit more. Um, yeah, right there. So I tried taking Clementine, my youngest dog, on a safari. And um, just before a new um, beginner dog class that I took to, it was a new space at the mall. She'd never been there. So I went 15 minutes early before any class had started. And I just let her sniff for 15 minutes. And it, I was amazed at how relaxed she was when the class started and because it was a brand new space and she was around brand new dogs she never met before. And I think it really calmed her down just to be able to have her fill sniffing that new space before, before we start the class. 
Uh, let's see. So the video that I'm going to show um, of Clementine taking a snafari is in a building. It's a building she's been in before, and she does know it's worth in it. But um, when I watched her do the snafari, behavior was different when she's doing nose work. When she's doing nose work, she's searching for a scent, and she's breathing much faster. When she was doing this nefari, I could hear that her breath was much slower. Um, so I, I really recommend going on a safari with your dog. It's a really interesting thing to do. Just watch your dog interact with the environment with their nose and do it at their own pace. Um, another thing that I would like to say is going on a safari is very similar to going on a, in some ways, very similar to doing nose work. And I really like nose work as a sport because I think it has a lot of elements of slow thinking incorporated in it. I think it's really good for God. <sighs> And that's all I've got. So does anyone have any questions? Hi, Marguerite. This is Lynn. Is that her nose work harness or is that a different harness? That's a different harness. OK, good. Yeah. It's her Snafari harness. It's her Snafari harness. <laughs> OK. Did you consider letting her run off leash just out of curiosity? No, there were other dogs there. Got it. How is that sniffing behavior different than the behavior she does when she does nose work? You said she sniffs, she breathes faster when she does nose work. What about her searching behavior? How is that different? Um, she breathes a lot faster when she's um, doing nose work. And I tend to keep her in a smaller area because usually she's on leash. And so I'm containing her with the leash, whereas in this, I just let her go wherever she wanted to go. Thank you.
you can also hear her when she's doing nose work, you can hear her from quite a distance. She's got a big set of lungs for a little tiny dog. Yeah, she tends to be a loud sniffer. And it was, it was pretty interesting how much more slowly she was sniffing with a sniffari than she was when she's doing nose work. It was more, she was just a lot more relaxed with, because she's a pretty drivey dog when she does nose work. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so uh, Lynn, Anguish, you're up. Mute myself. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about the up and down game, but I'd rather talk about that in context with the entire um, subject of pattern games. This is one thing that Laura Donaldson, she gave uh, a handout on this and we talked about it a little bit. The Dislat game is a pattern game. Um, and pattern games such as the up and down game, which is the one I'm gonna talk about later, are rhythmic games that you can play with your dog that help to defocus their attention to a stimulus or situation that causes them to become overly aggressive, fearful, worried, or any other negative reaction. So basically their trigger, it causes them to defocus from their trigger. So it takes their attention away from a stimulus which is negative for them and refocuses their attention on a behavior that is highly repetitive and easy for them to perform. It acts like rocking a crying baby to calm it. The baby forgets about whatever made him or her cry and finds relaxation in the repetitive rocking motion. And that's going to be the same thing for your dog. Uh, for a dog, a taught behavior pattern is relaxing because it is safe, it's predictable, they know exactly what to expect and what's going to happen, and they can choose to turn away from a worrisome trigger to perform it and they get rewarded for it. So the up and down game, make sure I can see what I'm doing here. Okay, there we go. The up and down game is all about marking and rewarding your dog for good decisions, such as disengaging from environmental triggers. So it's very similar to the dislike game. It's just a little bit different. Um, it rewards your dog's choice to reorient to you, reorient to you once you have purposely drawn its attention elsewhere. The up and down game provides a calming rhythm to use as a warm-up exercise for a training class and when you and your dog are waiting at the vet's office or for your next agility run. This game is particularly useful in helping dogs that are reactive on leash. Begin each walk with a minute or two of this game and you'll help your dog remain calm and focused during your walk. When you first introduce a pattern game, you should do it in a neutral area such as in a quiet room in your home without other people or pets. Once you and your dog have figured out the game, you can take it on the road. Try the game in an outside area with distractions, but not with specific triggers. For instance, if your dog is dog aggressive, you don't want to take this outside after being in a quiet room where there are a bunch of dogs around. You wanna maybe take it in your backyard and work where there might be squirrels or something that is not a trigger, but are distractions. So you do the game outside. So this is a lot like obedience training. You start by being in a quiet room, you teach the dog the behavior, then you try taking the behavior outside where it's quiet, then you take it to other places and eventually take it to Home Depot and then competition. So it's similar to that where you want to take it slow. Um, so you take it on the road, try the game in an outside area with distractions, but not the specific triggers. You do this until your dog can ignore its environment and play the game easily. Then 
If your dog has specific triggers that make them crazy, such as other dogs, you try the game in an area where there are other dogs at a distance, not close by. You never start close to your trigger. You start far away from your trigger. If your dog can't ignore the other dogs, that means you're too close. Move further away until you find a distance where your dog can focus on the game while still acknowledging that there are dogs nearby. Obviously, they're going to see the other dogs, but you want the dog far enough away from the trigger that, okay, I see them, but they're too far away to be a problem. Let's do this game because this is rewarding and it's calming me. Um, as your dog becomes successful in that area, uh, you can move closer to the stimulus that is unhinging them. Don't rush getting close to the other dogs if it's a dog issue. Um, you want your dog to be successful playing the game while still noticing that there are other dogs around. So this is similar to what Lynn was talking about, um, going to the dog park and staying far away. If your dog is reacting, you're too close. You need to be far enough away that your dog can still play this game with you. Um, this is going to assure that your dog is choosing to play the game while not reacting to their triggers. As you progress, you'll be able to get closer and closer to the trigger while your dog maintains control of their behavior, hopefully. Again, if you move too fast with this game and your dog becomes aroused with the stimulus, then you're too close to that stimulus. Remember, um, arousal is cumulative. And what this game, what pattern games are trying to do is instead of letting your dog look at its trigger and start ramping up its arousal, you're trying to interrupt that at an early stage get your dog to refocus on you and or food so that it learns that, oh, it's actually more fun to disengage and look at my owner and get food than it is to go crazy about these other things. And it, again, if you do it gradually, then um, you can get closer and closer to the triggers until hopefully um, you can be within a reasonable distance of the trigger and still have your dog disengaging from it on their own. Now, when you're playing this game, you do not say anything or do anything. This is all, you're rewarding the dog's behavior, his decision, his or her decision, not something you've told it to do. So you want to make sure that you take your time and each dog may express a different level of arousal to their triggers. For example, a dog that barks at all dogs that go by your house may have a lower level of arousal to other dogs than a rescue pit bull that has engaged in dog fighting. Obviously, the dog had, that has engaged in dog fighting is going to be much more aroused, much quickly, quicker than your dog who has never really engaged in a dog fight. He just likes to bark at everybody that goes by. So in these games, we use food as a reward. And the other thing is a dog that is not very interested in treats may not progress as fast as a dog that loves his cookies. So your progression when you're working with your own dog is going to be different for each dog you have and for each dog that different people are working with. So you should work at the pace that your dog is setting, not the pace that you decide. You can't say, okay, in three weeks, my dog will never bark at another dog again. Your dog is going to learn how to ignore the other stimulus at its own pace. And you should let your dog do that because this is allowing the dog to think and make decisions on its own. You are not directing it. So the pattern game that I'm gonna talk about is the up and down game. It's actually really, really simple. So here's how you train it. Um, when you're in your quiet room, you don't need to have your dog on leash. So you start out in your quiet room. You do not speak to your dog or cue your dog in this game. You place a treat at your feet and let your dog get it. That's the down part, this up and down game. And then you wait for your dog to look up at you. That's the up part. And then 
you, when the dog looks up at you, you put another treat at your feet. So after a couple of reps and your dog is starting to look at you every time after they get a treat, the treat is a stimulus and they look at you after every treat, you can start tossing the treat a short distance, let your dog get it and then wait for them to look back at you. Um, once they look back at you, even if they don't come, they don't have to come to you, they have to look at you. So what you're doing is you're throwing out a stimulus, your dog is taking the stimulus, it's eating the food, then it has to break that engagement with the food and look at you. So that's the disengagement part. So you're basically teaching your dog to disengage from some sort of stimulus. So again, once you've thrown it, wait till they get it, they look back at you, you throw another one, you throw it someplace else. So they have to go move to another area and pick up that treat and get it. And then hopefully look back at you. So this is all done for the first time you do it in a quiet room. If your dog becomes very, very consistent with doing this without any other problems, um, and they're reorienting to your face after their food, you've got the game. That's it. So now you take it on the road. When you take it on the road, your dog should be on leash unless you're in a controlled area where it can't get at any of its triggers. So I would start by taking my dog outside in my yard where there aren't any other dogs, there aren't any other people or anything, but there's all the environmental stimulus that it's going to get. And then you play the game the same way. Every time you go to a new place, you start with the food at your feet again, um, so that the dog is close to you and is orienting to you clo um, physically close. And then as they become really good at ignoring the squirrel on the tree or the bird or whatever, cars going by, then you can start tossing the treat and having your dog look back at you and then you toss another one, et cetera. So then um, after your dog is able to ignore general environmental stimuli, then you start working near your dog's trigger, whatever that happens to be. Maybe it is a squirrel. I don't know how you can control where the squirrel is, but um, I'm going to use other dogs because that seems to be um, the most worrisome issue. This also works for dogs who are afraid of things. Just like the dislat game, you can work, you can start at a great distance from let's say a vacuum or something and then move closer and closer as your dog becomes more comfortable and is, is playing the game really well with you and giving you their attention, you can get closer and closer to the vacuum. So um, you always start in a new place with a treat at your feet and you gradually increase the distance that you toss the treat. Again, if your dog's outside or obviously if it's near a trigger object like another dog, you want the dog on leash. Um, and that's about it. Um, so that's one of the ways, one of the pattern games that you can use to teach your dog to acknowledge a trigger. I mean, they know the dog is there, they're whatever, the squirrel or whatever, but they make the decision not to react to it in a negative way and they can de-escalate their own arousal, which is the most important part of this. Um, you can be creative and make up your own pattern game as long as it involves your dog turning away from a trigger towards you. Like I said, the dislet game is, is um, another one of these types of games. And that's what I got. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, I do again. Sorry, because I'm familiar with all this. Um, I learned about pattern games and LAT from Leslie McDivitt, who wrote Control Unleash. Did Laura talk about, did she get a lot of her stuff from Control Unleashed and Leslie McDivitt? She got, I'm sure she got some of her stuff from it, but the way she has put things together is her own take on it. I, I'm. I mean, I don't know where all of her stuff came from. She didn't really explain all of it, but 
um, so it could okay, be. And the other question, I, yeah, I yeah, the other, go ahead. I was just going to say she does acknowledge Leslie as the look at that portion of right. the dislat. Uh, but what yeah. I'm saying is she adds these other tweaks, which are the uh, using the food to, to sort of as part of the, uh, to stand in for triggers and this movement away. This is a, this right. released movement away and choice is just a, a, is what she's added to it that has, brings a whole uh, extra little, uh, freedom of choice to the dog and and really i think uh frees up the tension that the dog is having over the moment and it seems to add a lot to the exercise okay and the other question i have is um i find that there's uh i mean food is very good for lowering arousal but i find at least with my dogs is if i'm just placing pieces of food on the ground they have very low arousal. If I throw food, I actually throw food in training to increase arousal. So how does she distinguish? I don't understand why if you're trying to decrease arousal, you would be throwing food. Is it just so the dog starts to focus on coming back to you as opposed to um, looking at their trigger? Well, I think the dog has to move away from you in order to look back. I mean, you don't want, if the dog is staring at you the whole time, that's not teaching it to turn away from a trigger. No, I'm, I'm, I've, I've seen I pattern games. I understand what you mean. Throwing can make their arousal higher. That is true. But I think the whole point of this is not necessarily to change their arousal state, but for them to disengage from a negative type trigger to a positive trigger, which would be the owner. So it may not change it. I mean, it is going to change the arousal stakes. If you turn away from their trigger, then if you teach them to turn away from their trigger, then they are not going to be negatively aroused. Yes, they are going to be excited about coming back and getting the food, but I'd rather have my dog excited about coming back and getting the food than excited about going after somebody else's dog. Yeah. Right. And I, I agree, but you just said if you teach them to turn away and come back to you. So, and again, I don't mean to be argumentative. I'm just trying to understand how Laura Donaldson approaches it because I didn't take the class. Okay. Um, so is the dog choosing to turn away from the trigger or is the dog choosing to come back for food because it's been trained in this game or is it basically the same thing and it doesn't matter? Personally, I think it's the same thing and it doesn't matter. The, the idea, yes, they have been trained. It is a trained behavior, obviously, but you're trying to give your dog a, um, what's the word that I want? Um, a base behavior to use besides getting aroused with a trigger. So it's, um, what is the word? What's the word I want? My brain just went to sleep. Um, I, th I think, Lynn, I think part of it is about, and the way, because you're not ever cueing when you're doing any of these right, things, right. the There's whole no thing is about all. giving the dog a choice. It's giving the right. dog some personal agency about making a decision about how they're going to react to it. And yes, the food is used so that you can practice this in a safe place without the trigger being there, but eventually you'll be replacing that with when you're walking down, down the road and you see a dog coming, I'm not throwing, I'm not no. throwing a piece of food no. out towards that dog coming down. So now the trigger is simply the dog coming down there. It's not tossed food or it's not, I'm right. not throwing food at the vacuum cleaner. It, it's allowing the dog some decision about how they're going to respond to that situation. And the whole point of working on the up down or the dislat is to give your dog these little moment, take a little moment to just make a decision. And they have perfect right to make a decision and you will see if you're, if it's still, like I said with Ruby, if that dog is growling and lunging, she's not taking her eyes off of it and she's not coming back for food no matter what. <laughs> so 
Um, but she would dogs she would normally in the past have growled at or gotten all huffy about. She makes a simple decision. She looks at them and she's not deciding, oh, I see a dog, I'm coming back to her. She's looking at the dog and deciding, okay, actually that dog's not gonna be a problem. So I can come back for food. So I think what the games are about are offering dogs, um, they just get in the habit of taking a moment to make a decision about it. Right. It's I think that's all. And I've seen also the up down game. Some people's dogs get too excited with thrown food. So they just take like a giant step and place the food way away from them right. somewhere and come right. back. If their dog right. gets too excited right. by the right. thrown food, they just kind of reach way out and put down the food in, in odd places. It's also basically just teaching your dog a default behavior that they can choose to use instead of this negative behavior to a negative stimulus. I'm sure that most dogs, if they're reacting badly to a stimulus, they're not reacting because they're happy about it. They're reacting because they're really uncomfortable. They're either afraid or they're something's happened to them in the past that makes them when they go in that situation makes them really uncomfortable so if a dog is comfortable coming towards you between your feet or whatever to get a treat they're going to eventually choose that behavior over going towards a negative stimulus and being uncomfortable i, I think that is the point is you're giving them something else that they can do which will calm them down so they aren't escalating with this arousal, which they would do with a negative, oh my God, that dog's gonna kill me. Oh my God, that dog's, oh my God, that dog's gonna kill me. You it's sort of cut that off. There's a thing here where they, she showed a wonderful video of a dog that they were training with Gizlet. And they had, it was making good progress. So they went out to a park. They didn't go out to a park to find you know, a specific trigger. This dog's trigger was other dogs, right? Um, they went out to be in a quiet park to practice the game. Well, somebody walked a dog, not right next to them, but, you know, within a distance that the other dog noticed it. The dog, it, there's a transfer. The dog looked at that dog, turned away, didn't come begging for a treat, but turned away. And so there was a transference that it said, okay, I can use this same behavior when there's a trigger over there that bothers me. So there's, there's that. Right. For me, it's spinning on my spinning wheel. When I'm upset, I either eat or I spin on my spinning wheel. So that's my alternative behavior. My spinning wheel is my alternative behavior to eating when I'm upset. So I think it's the same sort of thing for a dog. You're giving them an alternate behavior that they can use when they're upset about something. I'm sure dogs don't want to escalate their arousal if, if it's something negative they're, they're afraid of. And so hopefully they would choose to, oh, but mom's got a treat and that makes me feel good. I'm going to choose that over being upset by this other dog. So I think that's basically it. You're, you're giving them something else to think about or something else to do besides become overstimulated. It also goes back to the first overview that uh, I guess it was Marty who talked about it, where fast twitch versus slow twitch. It's not so much right. that the dog decided, in, in the, if you have a reactive dog, that, that that dog is deciding to lunge and bark at that dog. It just does it. It's, it's an automatic thing. Exactly. And so what right. these games are doing it is letting, letting it have space, teaching it to give itself space to evaluate the situation. And, you know, they do it. Right. I mean, it seems to work. Yeah. Well, I watch my dogs. They're not horribly <laughs> reactive dogs, but they will pull back. You know, there'll be something and they'll stop and they'll look and they'll do something, but they stop and they look. I watched one of my puppies do it the other day. You know, everyone's dashing around and instead of dashing into the thing, 
you know, six weeks, seven week old puppy. She sits down, looks around, and decides what she's going to go yeah. to. I know you're not paying attention. I think that's a perfect kind of lead in to what I was going to talk about, which is um, working on an off switch and trying to get um, your dogs to relax. And this, I liked this topic because I talked to the club about how to get yourself as a handler to relax. And the two things that were talked about were teaching your dog to take a deep breath which I am not successful with. And I will show you my lack of success video on that. I cannot do it. Um, and the other is um, teaching the dog how to settle after being aroused. And I thought this was a lot like progressive muscle relaxation that you do in people where you tighten all your muscles and you feel tension. And then you actively take a breath and relax and teach yourself how to settle. So it, it kind of goes back and forth there. Um, there was an article that we had gotten, which was by Herbert Benson, and he described the relaxation response as the counterpart to the emergency response or fast thinking. So I have a three-part video, and the first part is showing me attempting to teach Nala how to take a deep breath, which involves similar to like if I would yawn. Oh, and I get a yawning response from some of you. Yes, um, you will. That's right. Or, but, but actually taking a deep breath and trying to get the dog to get an automatic mm. response. So a dog will inhale through their nostril and they'll exhale through the slits on the side of their nose. And so in the process of taking a deep breath, you're looking for the widening of the split on the side of their nose. And you'll see in the video, I actually put it in slow-mo for just a few seconds, not very long. There is no change. I tried, but it's good to see failure as well. The second video is sort of a step one on teaching a dog to relax. And again, I think the biggest takeaway I got was um, letting the dog decide, not cueing to get the responses that you want. And the third one is um, alternating between an activation, sort of what I call progressive relaxation, to um, trying to get her to settle. And I will say I'm not as practiced as the video that was shared with us, but I do think it gives a little sense of um, a few ways to teach a dog how to relax themselves. So this is my slow motion breathe and I get no nostril flare at all. So I'm trying to breathe. <laughs> this is a simple exercise on teaching a dog to settle where I'm just waiting for her to think. And in this instance, it's giving the dog a toy because eventually what you would like to have happen is the, when the dog wants to settle themselves, they go and get their favorite toy, they take it to their bed. And this is the, progressive relaxation or activation. I took a sit at first because I thought it was at least something in the right direction. For me, stop it. Busy and she definitely is not in a relaxed lie down. So that is would be the next step. And as she does this the second time, notice how much quicker she goes to the lie down. 
And I'm not saying anything in the video except settle, I'm giving her a cue to settle. And my clicker training is really off on this one. I almost didn't show you all. Terrible Good clicker, girl. I know. Good girl. And now I'm waiting for her to get out of the sphinx position and to flop onto her hip to show me that she's a little bit more relaxed. Nope. <laughs> I turned away to just try to disengage myself a little bit. So that was like two or three sessions of doing a few of those exercises each time. It really came quickly. Um, I really like the idea that my dog knows how to settle itself. Um, the first instance was the first video where, where you have a leash. Uh, one of the things that I was reading about that, that is that that's a really nice activity if you're taking your dog out and you're going to a cafe where you actually get to the point where you put the leash, you know, you put the, just put your foot on the leash and that becomes a signal to your dog that it's time to settle. I didn't use any words on that one. The other was going back and forth. And I liked that because it reminded me of playing with the dog and playing tug and getting them amped up but teaching them the difference between um, being aroused and being settled. And that is what I have if there's any questions on, on that. And that leaves us to finish up with Kathy. Kathy, you're muted. I just unmuted myself, even <laughs> before you said so. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we've talked about a bunch of stuff. And one thing to say is that Laura Donaldson developed her slow thinking specifically in response to aggression. But clearly, um, you know, we don't allow, I'm, I'm thinking about how we in IDC, IDTC can use it in terms of our teaching, not just our own dogs in our own homes, but how we can teach it, how we can use this method, maybe modifying it, whatever, um, within our classes possibly. And we don't allow re truly reactive dogs in classes, although Lynn Wilkes and I had one once. <laughs> and, um, but these, these techniques also have a place with non-aggressive, but very distract, with distracted dogs and unfocused dogs, um, where they're excited rather than scared or ang um, anxious. Um, in our classes, generally, we certainly work on a lot of attention work with the handler, uh, attention to the handler. Um, very often we do this in the context though, of, a, um, of a cueing you know, using a treat or whatever to get the dog to look at you, to pay attention. So there's a lot of the handler directed. Um, and sometimes when you've got these really excitable dogs, it doesn't help a whole lot. Um, although we do generally have pretty good results. And it's certainly, I don't want to down what we do at all because the difference between the first day of class and the last day of class is just phenomenal generally anyway, but we are, we, it's not uncommon to have outliers that haven't made that progress. Um, not only do we have problems with the dogs, 
but sometimes we have problems with the handlers um, where they'll have issues <clears throat> with doing an attention exercise, with talking to their dogs to get them to attention, to working with their dogs that I was, you know, I've, I've watched beginners all the way through class, even with me and a um, assistant working with them, where they never get to the point where their dog isn't barking at the dog next to them. Um, it happens. Um, and also when we look at our uh, surveys that we get in terms of what our uh, students want, very often prime things on there are they want it to work on distractions and they want to work on pulling. Um, and we, I mean, I know I always tell them the dog isn't, can't learn if they're not paying attention. Um, but this slow thinking in dogs very much has the emphasis on the dog slowing down its reactions and thinking, um, which is different than being cued. Um, so I think at least there's a good place for um, the relax and think about it exercises that can be possibly more useful to our, some of our beginners than a good stand or a finish. <laughs> um, I don't think we're gonna do, be doing free work or full dislat, that those things are gonna fit into an IDT class unless a specific class were um, designed specifically for slow thinking. And Laura, I mean, a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, um, you do not in the context of a class. And Laura prefers you to have, be working one-on-one -on, -one on a dog, but she does do classes or she has, I've seen pictures of her doing classes. Um, mostly she works one-on-one -on -one with her people because she's working on reactive, aggressive dogs. But um, I think we could do things in our classes. So what kind of things might be done in the context of a beginner class? Um, nobody today talked about relax on a mat. Um, but that was the very first thing that was shown in uh, her, her presentations. Just, and it wasn't, <clears throat> they, she had people coming over and sort of pointing to the mat, but not, not a go lie down, lie down, lie down, go. Not so much that. Um, pointing to the mat, getting the dog oriented to the mat, and tossing a treat on it. Yeah, we're using a lot of treats. Um, tossing a treat on it. Um, and this is interesting because I train without treats generally, but I can see where, you know, you need something um, besides, because we're trying not to interact a lot personally with our dogs. So I don't use treats a lot when I do obedience training because I do interact a lot and I do a lot of quiet praise, loud praise, whatever. But anyway, in this, you're using treats. Um, let's see, where did I want, okay, so, you know, so she's got the dog oriented to the mat, you know, tree to the mat, dogs oriented to the mat, she waits. Is the dog going to offer a lie down? Um, so there's a lot of waiting in this, and if the dog offers a lie down, and I like the word, if it offers a lie down, then you give it another treat. Um, okay, um, the up and down game that was discussed, that's something that seems, you know, we could do in class. Um, leash work, this is something that wasn't specifically talked about. We do a ton of leash work, obviously, but we do an awful lot with talking to the dog, pay attention, pay attention, um, you know, walk faster so the dog has to pay attention to you. Slow down, but talk to it, talk to it. And those are all wonderful things. Those are great things but I've also seen it fail for, for a bunch of handlers, um, either because their dog is just very excitable and really wants to go to that other dog over there, or the person cannot seem to get the hang of talking to their dogs. Um, they also, you can tell, sometimes you can keep telling people, okay, dog's gonna pay attention to you, speed up. And then you see these people slowing down more and more and more, trying to talk to their dogs and get them to follow. And you're practically chasing this person saying, okay, let's move, speed it up. So there can be other 
um, methods that can work better for different trainers as well. Um, what I do with the leash, I mean, it, this is all, you know, obviously out in the, in the literature and everywhere is that I guess they call it red light, green light, but, you know, or stop and go. You don't talk, you, you stop. Dogs pulling, stop. And wait for it to offer letting, detentioning the leash or looking back at you. And in this particular exercise, you don't treat the dog for that. It's reward as you start walking again. And as soon as that dog, you know, to begin with, obviously, when you start walking again, the dog pulls. And even with my stubborn Vladi, um, it took a while, but it works. And he does really think about it now. And he's better than my other dog at, uh, he's really, Nika. Nika. Yeah, he's, he's good. He's very, very good about, after months of not doing this in the winter, um, we walked, he pulled, I stopped, and he goes, oh, yeah. You can see him thinking, oh, yeah, this is what we do. I know this. So that's something that um, I have incorporated into my classes, and I am thinking about more ways to incorporate it. Breathing, breathing. Um, that's another thing potentially that could be incorporated into class. Um, Letting the dog, getting our people to let their dogs think without constant cueing. Uh, so one of the things I'm thinking is to do this kind of thing, you'd have to, you know, I have a tendency that as my dogs get better to get them closer together so they can work close together, but, you know, more distance so that you've, you're working away from that distraction. You're giving them the time to think rather than cueing, cueing to ignore it. Um, so a lot of the things that we've talked about, they do um, in quiet areas. A class is not a quiet area. Um, so one thought, thing I thought about was that uh, an instructor could demonstrate the behavior, demonstrate how you might work with a dog to do this, and obviously not with a dog that knows nothing, never done it before, and then send them home with homework. And then the next time they come to class, find a time like, you know, with this, with like lying down, going to a mat, lying down, and then just being still that um, you can start with your mats pretty darn far apart. And week to week to week, maybe they don't get all that closer together, but I can just see a class where the dogs are just lounging there, sort of panting and looking around and, and you know, it could happen, right? Um, I was thinking about a uh, mini dislat. Um, for instance, we've got dogs that continue to bark, stare at, and run toward neighboring dogs. That happens more often than I like um, when I've got a, a handler that just really doesn't seem to be in control of their dog. And they don't seem to... I've had one or two where they haven't gained a whole lot of control over the course or over the course of the... Uh, maybe that's my fault, uh, but I'm working with Jean Bonacera, so you know, <laughs> you know, she's really good. And sometimes it's just the handler and the dog. Okay, so a mini dislat um, might allow you to, if you've got a dog that's stubbornly focused on another dog, barking at another dog, and you don't have a owner that can distract very well you could possibly teach them to really step back out of the circle, toss some treats, you know, and, uh, you know, sort of work with a mini dislat. Um, all right, and also that kind of thing could be a real good job for an assistant. So the uh, instructor's not gonna be able to work with one-on-one -on -one with a dog that needs to get out of the circle. But if you've got a good uh, assistant, that's a real good use, that could potentially be a, a good way to use an assistant. Okay, how to, how to fit this in? Because I find the, the, uh, my classes tend to go a little over time. Um, and I don't all, you know, getting through everything to the stage that I want them to get to is a challenge in six weeks. Um, 
Yeah. Oh, how to fit it in. Um, long time ago, I taught, well, we had seven sessions, seven, seven, seven sessions, and then a graduation. So add an extra session, add an extra class to the session possibility. Take something out of the very first beginner class. Um, I have noted that when I'm teaching beginner two, I get a lot, I get some dogs and handlers that really don't seem to have mastered beginner one. And I'm doing a bunch of, the first half of beginner two is a lot of beginner one, um, or trying to get that level of ease between the person, the handler and the dog. And so, maybe backing off on a couple of the exercises in beginner one, because sometimes I don't think they get them anyway, and adding some of this um, might help. Um, let's see. Then there's always the possibility of adding a beginner one class, you know, actually advertising it for people who have kind of not reactive dogs, but distracted dogs, excited dogs, and have a beginner one class that focuses more on the slow thinking, the getting the dog to disengage, to think, getting the owner to disengage and it, disengage from always cueing, 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 giving the dog some space. So a thought I had was that we potentially could have, and unless this sounds totally off the wall to everybody, um, that we potentially could have a committee of folks maybe some folks that did this workshop and have a little bit of thought about some of these methods and maybe some people from the training committee, actually I see there's some overlap here anyway, um, to talk about feasibility, how this might be done, how it could be fit into classes or class added or something and that's it, I'm done. <laughs> Hi, I just had one comment on some of these, uh, you know, we have, uh, there are the variety of focus games we've used in all the classes. I think it would be nice to uh, put together perhaps a YouTube uh, video of focus games that we could give, if someone's enrolled in a class, we give it to them before the class. And then we can check on the first day of class how they're coming with those. But we don't have to then spend all the time with the specifics of it. People, this is because the focus games are things that they should start with in their kitchen. <laughs> and then they can build on them in the class. But I find yelling at everyone about focus games <laughs> and trying to explain them and catch everyone doing it because there, there is a need when you're doing the focus games to reward quickly and uh consistently <laughs> uh, that it would be nice to have some kind of uh, maybe video library of focus games that we could give out to people to watch at home and work on before they start our classes so that we're not spending quite so much time in class trying to to work on that but we'll see i think that would be a great idea lynn because it's, I think um, a focus game is something where not just the, you're not just trying to get the dog to focus, but the handler has to focus as well. And in a class setting, you always have one ear on the instructor and one ear on your dog. And I think it's difficult sometimes for people to get that in a class situation. But if they had a video, a YouTube video or something they could do at home in a quiet area, they could watch the video and then try it with their dog where they can actually focus on the focus game. I'm thinking that potentially, you know, not do the focus game all the time with everybody, but that you have people that there's a demonstration. It's like a video. It's a demonstration, right. but it very often when I'm watching videos, um, I have questions. And right. they don't answer me. So yeah, that, that's why we that's why we would do them the first class, you yeah. know, 
we would go over them first class, but they would have had time to sort of absorb and try them and see what their issues are. Or do them right. <laughs> and, and we can fine tune them. Yeah. Right. Class. One thing I want to say is um, Becky has set up some, some mini free work areas in her class. And I'm in the beginner one class right after her puppy class. And those free work areas are really great for when, you're, when your young dog needs a break. You know, because training a young dog for 45 minutes to an hour is a very long time. Yeah. And they need a break. And so what I found is when I feel like Clemmy has had enough, I take her to the free work area and it's really relaxing for her to just go and sniff all that stuff. So I think there is a role for free work in our classes. And I think at the mall, we have room to do that. Another nice thing about that space at the mall is sometimes I can just take her way to the back of the class and give her a break from everything that's going on. Um, so there is more room to just get the dog out, and maybe do some little games in the back with her. So that new space at the mall does create new opportunities that we could take mm -hmm. advantage of with training dogs in class. And I, and I do think that the um, setting up little free work areas is a really great thing to do in a beginning, you know, a puppy class or beginner one. And I think sometimes it's good for the handlers as well, because if someone has never trained a dog before, none of this comes natural to them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of teaching a dog something is just getting comfortable with the equipment, comfortable with, you know, what you're trying to show in class. And I think if a handler gets a little bit overwhelmed, they can take their dog to the free area and just practice what you just went over so that they're a little bit more comfortable with it or just take time out to, to think about it. So I think that's a really good idea. I have two suggestions, Lynn, is one to add Kathy's, uh, you know, to our agenda, like in talking about, uh, talking about that, we should also talk about, and I don't think we have to make videos. There's a lot of videos out there, but if you right. have, page with links like if we picked one yeah it would be really interesting to get all of the people who instruct classes not just the training committee together to talk about some of those things so i put those three things yeah. there. um and it's 9 15 which is a very long program and but i think those would be three things to loop back to and finish up finish off with I think that maybe uh, we could have a training committee meeting soon, like not in the next week, but soon and talk about maybe some continuing education for instructors and present some of these things to the instructors, um, get some video links, just so that, you know, they're obviously not many of them are listening tonight and maybe they'll listen, maybe they'll look at this later, um, but, I think it would be really nice to, because the instructors have all those written um, class things that they can follow, but I think some of them are a little outdated. They were written like when I first became a member not long after, and I've been a member for a long time. Um, so maybe we should um, think about some additional things that we could have like a, a workshop for instructors and assistants. I think it might be a good idea to think of a, a working with the instructors as an interaction rather than just we're going to teach the instructors stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. A workshop, not a, not a teaching class, a workshop so that they can um, maybe bring their dogs 
and uh, work on some of these things because you can't teach something if you haven't done it yourself. So if we can teach the instructors some of these things that we've learned in this class, uh, then they can use those in their classes. Um, excuse me, I, you're now getting on the training committee stuff. Have we finished the program? Well, we were following up on Kathy's um, yeah, I know, I know, but it's about it's putting it. stuff into our classes. Yeah, but I, I agree that that's, but that's sort of something the training. Is there anything more in this Laura, Laura Donaldson stuff? Because the State of the Union's I, on, and I'm going that, to leave. Uh, the program is complete. Okay, thank you. It was very interesting, and I did enjoy listening to it. But uh, there are other things in life. Okay, yep. bye bye. <laughs> Susan, do you have a question? Yes, um, basically, we used to have every year a workshop for all the instructors and assistants. And so to have workshops again would be great because methods have changed, things have changed. Um, so I know that we used to do that and, you know, have lunch or whatever kind of format. So I'll leave that to the training committee to figure out what they'd like. And if there's money involved or something we can do to help, you know, just let me know and we can propose it to the board. The other thing is the material is very old. Some of it I remember way back when Min Fisi first did it. Um, so some of the material is old and that's a whole other area that, you know, you can look at. I also don't know what's happening about the uh, space in the uh, oh. mall. Are you guys planning to have classes there again or things like that? Because if it is, we have to do contracts and so forth. So we those are all the things. Yeah, Under we had, control. We had a meeting okay. Sunday and I reached out to the mall to see if it was available. So we don't have the info we have yet to bring to the board, but we are fingers crossed that we're going to uh, bring a request to the board that we can repeat this training space for the next spring classes. Okay, awesome, thank you. So just let me know and uh, thank you for having the program. It was very interesting. And you certainly all can put in for your uh, reimbursement of a, a version of what you've spent. And so um, Lynn, maybe you can coordinate that um, so that uh, Susan won't get confused of who to get what and where. So if you can collect uh, everybody's reimbursement forms and send it to uh, Susan Beals so they can get some of the money I back. I think Becky has already collected already those. Yeah. Okay. All collected. Um, is it better in electronic or paper form? Probably electronic if you can. I got and it all. So yeah. I'll talk with Lynn about how we do that. Okay, I just want have to any, yeah. do you have anything too. for me? Uh, Becky, do you have anything for me? I've forgotten whether I've done it or not. I believe I do. I, I, I think they beat us all over the head until we gave them to her. I'm going to stop the recording. Yeah, yeah, stop the recording. You don't need to record anymore.